And let's take a moment to watch our Spotlight on Ministry. It's uh, from the Junior High Mission Trip. For two days in June, 33 junior high students served in St. Louis, Missouri. I asked some of them to tell me about their experiences. I was at a ministry called The Bridge in St. Louis. We went to the St. Louis Food Bank and we helped at The Bridge. I like the feeling that we actually helped someone and even when we feel like we did something like very small, they're so thankful for whatever we did. It really kind of dawned on me that I was so fortunate to have everything that I have. Well, we fed 4,000 some meals at the food bank. Everyone likes going on the mission trips because they feel like they really did something. You help people, you meet people, and you really understand things a lot more. At the soup kitchen, a lady told us that God was working through us to help her. And I think that's the best thing that anyone's ever told me. There's no age limit on going out on mission. Where will you fit into the mission story of Woods Chapel? It made me learn that anyone can make a difference. Today we continue our series in the book of Acts. We have this week and next week, and if you're... Uh, measuring all of this out, we're not going to finish the book. You're right. So uh, we want to encourage you to keep reading. There's a lot of wonderful things in the book of Acts, great stories of what the early disciples did that are uh, not just informative but encouraging to, to us. Um, in um, August, we're going to have a series, four weeks on forgiveness. It's called Dirt, things that we just soon wish we could figure out how to sweep out of our lives sweep out of our, our hearts um, of all the things that come up over and over and over again when I talk to people is the need for them to believe that God forgives them, a, belief, uh, a need for them to learn and, and understand that, that to forgive themselves. And then there's that pesky thing of learning to forgive others um, and just all that comes with that. So, uh, encourage you to invite your friends for, for that series in August. And if I remember, uh, we have a, a video clip after service, kind of a promo for that. Uh, Kenny, you can wait. You know what, do you have it? Just remind me at the end of the service, and, and, and we'll, we'll do that. Uh, today we've got a great story. It's um, Paul and Silas are in jail. And the, this whole week, as I've been reading and thinking about this, my brain has pre um, exchanged Paul for Peter. So if I say Peter today and I meant Paul, then know that I knew what I was thinking. It just didn't come out right. Uh, and we're going to pick it up in Acts 16, beginning at verse 22. They're in the town square and they're in trouble. So let's stand for our scripture reading. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. The magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they'd been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. The jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to take his life because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And the whole family was filled with joy because they'd come to believe in God. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. May God send his Holy Spirit to bless it to our hearts as we gather in his name today. Please be seated. 
three things that I want to look at in this story today. And I'm going backwards because my brain works that way sometimes. What is this with the Philippian jailer and his house? How is it that he gets to make a decision for his house? It doesn't work that way at my house. If I go home and say, we're all going to become this, um, I don't get a single uh, yay. Uh, how does this happen? How, this, is, this is something that is unusual for our, for our culture, for, for the way our brains work. And that is because we live in the post-Reformation world. Some big change happened in the 1500s and the 1600s where prior to that, we lived largely in, in groups, in clans, and followed the leaders. And, and during the Enlightenment and the Reformation, we got the printing press. We learned to read. We started to read. We started to make our own decisions. All the Protestant churches break off from the Catholic Church. And, and our theology follows this pursuit of individuality, this pursuit of me understanding and, and choosing for myself, and it radically changed some of what had happened prior to that. In the pre-Reformation world, there was someone who was in charge, usually the male, because in, in many cultures, certainly in this culture, the women and the children were, were property. Remember in Genesis 12, when, when Abraham uh, is, is talking with God, and God says, get up and leave Ur of the Chaldees, and I'm going to take you to, to a land of promise that you know not of. Uh, scripture tells the story. He and his wife and kids and all the animals and the cousins and everybody went. The whole crew went. Can you imagine going home to your house and saying, we're going to be moving and I can't tell you where because God hasn't told me yet. But they follow Abraham into this new place. We see it over and over again in, in the Old Testament times. In the story of Jacob and Esau, uh, there's this rivalry between them. Esau's the older, and he's supposed to get the blessing of his father. Uh, he has a birthright because he's the oldest. He is tricked out of one, sells the other. And it's a tragic story that we don't really get, but it's tragic because in that culture, the eldest son stands to lead the clan in the future. In our world, we treat all our kids the same. Line them up. Allie, Jenny, Scott. Going to make sure that nobody gets to complain that this one got something that this one didn't get. You know what I'm talking about. They all have to be treated the same. Not so in that culture. To be the oldest male was a very important thing. So, so Jacob and, and Esau, they're fussing and fighting their entire lives. And as you follow their story, and many of the stories of, of the great Old Testament patriarchs, we call them that for a reason, not simply because they were fathers of, of our faith, but they were, they were leaders of, of their tribes, of, of their groups. We find them rarely by themselves, often with an entourage, with entire uh, families, extended families, lots of men. Um, uh, it, later in Genesis, when Jacob and Esau meet up, and, and it's kind of nervous, a nervous time because Jacob's going to get his due, Esau has 400 fighting men. He is leader of a very big clan now. And, and this is common in the Old Testament, that one person's in charge and everybody just kind of goes with that. It was important to do that to stay alive. The clan kept you alive. The group took care of you. If you bolted off by, by yourself out in the middle of the desert, you know it might not go, go very well. So um, it's not surprising that Paul and Silas talked to the jailer. And we have this story that this extended group of people somehow are saved, somehow come to faith. What do, we, what do we learn from that? Well, I don't think we learn that we're going to go home and tell everybody how it is, because that's just not the way our, our world works any, anymore. But clearly, there is a sense that all of us have responsibilities to our children, to our spouses, to everyone in our sphere of influence to, to pass on uh, the teachings of Christ. And we hear so much in our world today about, oh, the separation of church and state, for example, that we're just nervous sometimes to even tell anything about our faith. It's kind of just become sort of a private thing. And folks, if we don't teach our children, if we don't teach our grandchildren, if we're not helping our neighbors in, in timely and appropriate ways learn the things of Christ, 
the culture will teach them something. The Kardashians have quite a message that they want to imprint upon our children. What's that show that's on in our house sometimes? The Real Housewives of Orange County, Beverly, whatever, right? Now, I got a question. Why couldn't they just call it the Housewives of such and such? Like if you add real on it, it's like the real Ghostbusters. This is really real. This is how it really works. I mean, watch this show. This is how it really works. The culture wants to imprint upon us what's important. And so it's so important that all of us need to sit down with our spouses and just on our own to do everything we possibly can to help people understand about God's love, about God's saving acts in Christ, and, and to teach people the great commandments. And, and what, did, what did Jesus answer when he was asked? What's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like it, love your Love your neighbor as yourself. That hasn't changed. That isn't any different now than it was then. These are the most important things that we can imprint upon our, our children. And if we are not ready to do that, uh, the culture will certainly imprint its own stories upon them. Part number two. Um, and, and again, I'm stuck on this uh, jailer and his whole household. I just got to tell you, that's not how my theology works. I mean, I wasn't raised to think that my dad was going to decide that we were all Christians and it was all going to work that way. I mean, I was raised, as all of you were, in a post-Reformation society where all of us are thinking that we have to learn, we have to know, and we have to choose. So I read this story and I don't get this story. My mind doesn't get this story. And a lot of people look for ways to, to add things to this story so it makes sense and fits our theology. Did you know you could do that? If you don't like something in the Bible, you can kind of add some of your own stuff to it to make sure it fits the way that you see the world. This one just doesn't quite fit for us. Uh, we, we, we like the stories of individual people encountering Christ and being transformed. You know, uh, in John chapter 3, uh, Nicodemus goes to Jesus at night, and they, they have this encounter, and, and Nicodemus gets to make some choices. And uh, Paul on the road to Damascus is a great, it's a one-on-one. -on -one. It's, it's the light from heaven and, 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 and the voice uh, calling, out, calling out to Paul. And we like that story because this is how our brains work. We live in a post-Reformation world. It's all about me. It's all about me choosing. It's about me understanding uh, the uh, Ethiopian eunuch is a story we like because he's reading the scripture and Philip talks to him and he says, hey, I want to be baptized. And so, so again, we see this, these events happening in ways that fit the way our brains work, but not every passage in scripture works with our paradigm. And what that tells me is God is probably bigger than how I see things. I continue to struggle with the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, a lot of people like that story. There's a lot of problems in that story for my theology because that story begins with a question. Someone asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the end result is this story about someone who is living a life of love. And I wanted to ask Jesus, do you ever have things you want to ask Jesus? Like, if you could come back and just spend a couple hours, I have some questions I've been collecting. You know, we don't really believe that just being a good person is going to get you there. And I'm not suggesting that that's what the story of the Good Samaritan teaches, but it's a little bit outside of my paradigm. Because in response to the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life, Jesus tells them the story and says, now, you go live like that there's something about about how we live that matters. It's not just what we think. It's not just just what we we say. So so gosh, what? I went to church and the preacher told a story that didn't fit my picture of God. And you know what I want to tell you? That's good news for every single person whose Christian experience doesn't fit the mold. If you've ever been around somebody and they're telling their testimony and and it's great, but it's not your deal. I mean, yours isn't quite like that. And you feel bad. Gosh, I, that didn't happen to me like that. You know what I'm talking about? That didn't work just that way for me. This is good news for you. 
It's good news for me. God works with lots of different people in so many ways. Um, this happened to me. It's happened to other people that I've talked to. When, when I was in junior and senior high school, I kept praying the prayers over and over again because somebody kept telling me I wasn't doing it right. And I find these stories that are outside of, of, of some of what we normally say, and it just reminds me that God is bigger and greater than my understanding of Him. God will not be condensed. God will not be minimalized. God will not be humanized. The Christian faith is, uh, is, is beyond our, our explaining it com- completely. There are so many paradoxes. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, but He also said, uh, I've not come to bring peace but a sword. And we go, what? And He's the Son of God, but He's also the Son of Man. And we go, what? And, and we believe in free will, but then there's that Paul on the road to Damascus story, and I didn't, didn't seem like Paul got much of a choice to me. I mean, if I'm walking down the road and I hear an audible voice and a light shines on me, I'm probably just going to, you know, do, do whatever. We can't pin God down, which is what I'm trying to uh, lift up to you. In seminary, they had this thing called systematic theology, a big book or lots of books, and and the idea of systematic theology is you take all the disciplines of theology and you mix them all together so you have one concise explanation of how God works in the world. And, and so you go to seminary and you read these things and then you sleep. You read a little bit and you sleep and you read a little bit. And you know what? Think about the impossible task of condensing and explaining everything that God does down into one little book. They raise more questions than they answer because God is so much more enormous, so much more vastly amazing than, than what my brain can understand and hold to about him. He will not be condensed. He will not be minimalized. Part three, the circumstances of the apostles. Uh, here they are, Paul, not Peter, but Paul and Silas in jail. Is this a good story? I, I, you know, on, on, the, on the front, I, want, I just want to like this story. Um, I, I like, I like that they get released and I like that, you know, what happens for the jailer, um, and, and his family. But, you know, sometimes when you really think about what happens to these people, if you like just kind of chase the story in your brain, they've gone on a trip to tell people about God's love and now they're arrested in a town far from home. They're arrested stripped naked and beaten. I need a volunteer today. I mean, just the being stripped naked part in the square doesn't sound like anything that any of us want to have anything to do with. But when it says beaten, a Roman beating was with rods. And I I, said, okay, what would that be like? Well, when I think of the word rod, I think of a fishing rod and I think of when I was a kid, I had a cane pole, you know, and that's kind of like a rod. And we used to fish with, with that at uh, Swole Park. Didn't catch any fish, but we used to get caught in the trees all the time, you know. And, and you know, those poles were about a half inch big around. Would you, would you run from me if I had one of those? They only weigh about half a pound. There's got to be more to this rod story than what my brain comes to. And this week we were watching the Shawshank Redemption, the the prison movie, and the guards are beating the prisoners with the billy clubs, and they're really hurting them. And I wonder, is this what a rod, is this what it means to be beaten with rods? And I'm reading randomly in the Scripture, and I find this passage in Exodus. And let this be a lesson to you. Be very, very careful about pulling a piece of the Old Testament law and trying to apply it to today, Exodus 21. Anyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a direct result. But they are not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two since the slave is their property. This tells me that the purpose of being beaten with a rod was to take you to the point of death, was to teach you a lesson. And here's Paul and Silas, gone this long journey to tell people about God's love, stripped naked and now beaten, 
badly. In chains, in stocks, in the innermost, nastiest room of the prison. There's no recreation time in the yard. There's no license plate factory for them to go work at. There's no bathroom breaks. This is a dirty, nasty, smelly place. But do you hear what's coming out of them? They are praying and singing praises to God. So much so that all the other prisoners have stopped to listen to them. How amazing that in the worst, in the worst of circumstances, in all the pain and embarrassment that they felt, they are singing praise to God. This past week, I attended with a few of our our staff, part of the National Worship Leaders Convention, and I and I picked a couple of things I wanted to go to. Uh, one of the seminars was taught by a pastor from Franklin, Tennessee, named Scotty Smith, and, and the the hour long class was about uh, identifying and helping people that are in burnout. Uh, pastors, staff, Christian leaders, members of your church who are just exhausted spiritually, who are just at the end of themselves. And I don't know about you, but I, I wanted to go to that because I, I think we understand that. I think all of us have had those moments where we just feel like I, I just am at the end. I'm just at the end of who I am. And Scotty Smith holds up uh, Psalm 73. And you've got to love the psalmist. You've got to love the psalmist because he's so much like us. He's so happy and joyful and good one day, and then the next psalm you crack open, he's unhappy and he's a mess, and, and he's saying things that you, you, you think, gosh, are we supposed to think like that? And sometimes the answer is no. In Psalm 73, he's just, he's just done. He's just at the end of himself, and, he, and he's crying out to God, um, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. As for me, my feet had almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold. I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. This is what the wicked are like. They're always carefree. They just go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. Because all day long I'm afflicted. Every morning just brings me new punishments. My heart was grieved and my spirit embittered. I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a brute beast before you. You ever feel that way about life and just let it come out in your talk to God? I am so mad! I am so upset. It is so not right. It is so unfair. Look what's happening to me. Look what's happening in my home. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? Look at what's happening at work. God, do you read the news? It's not fair. Come on. Where are you at? Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to follow you. And like, you're not even with me. What's the deal? This happens to us. And we feel so broken. And it happens to us because we're looking at the wrong things. We're looking at all the bad, all the broken, all the trouble. This is what I would expect to come out of the mouths of Paul and Silas. But instead of complaining, instead of lifting a complaint, they are praising God. Beaten, chained, filthy, and naked. 
They are praising God. It must have been an amazing thing. And you know, you know it's true that when we can do this, in the moments that we can do what they did, which is to give thanks to God, to be grateful, to see the good, to honor Him, instead of focusing on the circumstances, man, our hearts are so alive. A miracle happens. Their, their chains fall off and they're free. Don't you feel free when your heart is turned to God? Don't you feel joy when your heart is turned to God? Don't you feel released from all the things that two hours ago were driving me absolutely nuts? When we turn our eyes upon Jesus, our chains come off. And something else that's really awesome about this story is everybody's chains come off. Everybody's chains come off. You know, we, we have more power than we think. If I walk into the room and I'm unhappy and complaining about how terrible it is and how, you know, everybody just kind of balls up and looks in a corner to hide. When I come home and I'm angry, everybody just goes to hide. You know, they shut the door and pull the drapes. And we're all in chains because somebody's, somebody's angry. Somebody's not getting a fair shake. But what happens when you walk into the room and everybody knows what's going on? Everybody knows what the world is like, but you can say, God is still on the throne. We have so much to be thankful for. God is so good. Let's turn our hearts to Him in joy. You know, our chains fall off. We have the chance to hear that, as the prisoners did, to listen to that. And let our hearts join in the sense of joy. So, um, we got our stuff, you and me. We got our chains and our burdens and our beatings and all the things that drag us down. But we also have a choice every day. Whether to look at those things or look at the one, look to the one who draws us in and embraces us and reminds us that life is good, that love is still active, that in trusting Christ, we have everything that we need and more. Let's pray. And so we look to you, Father. We are so thankful for all that you've created, for all that you are, for the amazing things that you do, for the ways that you baffle my brain. For the ways that you restore relationships. For the ways that you can teach us to sing when we thought the song was gone. We thank you for who you are. We lift you up in this moment. We honor you. We thank you. We praise you. So let our chains and the chains of all who hear our song come off. In Jesus' name, amen.